Spring always feels like a time for new beginnings, so the educational YouTubers of WeCreateEDU have created a playlist of videos centered around the idea of firsts. You can find a link to the playlist down in the description, and I definitely recommend you check out all of the other videos made by some amazing and thoughtful people. First is all about going back to the beginning of something, so today I'd like to explore the beginnings of the ideas I hold most dear. So who were the first environmentalists? First, I feel like it's only responsible to take a moment to address indigenous knowledge and the odd relationship between indigenous peoples and white environmentalists. When these two groups work together on problems of joint concern, they can be very productive, but they can also wind up very much at odds. This is basically because we tend to try to evaluate native peoples according to our Euro-American ideals, standards, and concepts, but the world and its cultures are too complicated and diverse for that to ever be a good idea. The outsider perspective of white environmentalists led to the propagation of the myth of the noble savage, or this idea that all indigenous peoples lived in an idyllic state within the environment of their homelands. This is problematic for a variety of reasons, but two big ones for me are that the noble savage idea pretty much denies the complexity of native cultures and the advancement of their societies, and also that situating indigenous people perfectly within nature kind of equates them to animals. <coughs> Scientific racism, what? It's also problematic because it puts unfair expectations on native peoples. If members of these groups don't live the perfect Disney Pocahontas spirit of nature life, they're seen by outsiders as a disappointment. Realistically, indigenous peoples have altered their environments to suit their own needs in much the same way that all of us have. Just think about hunting techniques like burning the prairie to flush game or building large fishing weirs in rivers. But I am not a member of an indigenous group, so I'm definitely not the best person to speak on these truths. And this topic is big enough to deserve at least one video of its own. In the meantime, I've left some links to sources in the video description, and I hope to examine these ideas in more detail in the future. If we're not falling prey to the noble savage myth, the other group of people we might automatically associate with the environmental movement are middle and upper class white males. Men like Thoreau, Whitman, Muir, Emerson, Audubon, Pinchot, and others certainly had the education, financial resources, and leisure time to devote to active environmentalism, but they were far from the only people to have an impact. Throughout history, environmentalism has been championed by men and women, children and adults, and people of all races and creeds. However, much of the information that's recorded and readily available on this topic is about white men, small wonder, so we will talk about several of them today. That being said, I would love to revisit this topic in future videos to give voices to those not-so-famous visionaries. If we reel our timeline way far back, we can find King Devanampiya Tissa of Anuradhapura, or what we now know as Sri Lanka. In the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE, King Tissa planted what may be the oldest intentionally human-planted tree in the world, and also designated one of the world's first wildlife preserves. Jumping forward a little bit to get to CE time, we can consider Saint Cuthbert of Lindisfarne, who was a monk in the mid-600s. Cuthbert developed what were perhaps the first conservation rules for a bird when he made laws protecting eider ducks on the Farne Islands. The ducks, who still live on those islands, are also known as cuddy ducks because cuddy is an affectionate form of the name Cuthbert. One century later in colonial America, William Penn made what was known as the five to one rule. For every five acres of land a settler cleared in the new colony of Pennsylvania, they were required to protect one acre of land to preserve the famed tree cover of the area. Penn was also a big fan of the idea of green country towns and tried to design the city of Philadelphia with green spaces. Just a few decades after that, a man named Friedrich Wilhelm Heinrich Alexander, Freiherr or Baron von Humboldt arrived on the scene. Humboldt was a botanist and geologist from Germany, duh, who traveled throughout South America. If Humboldt sounds familiar, it's probably because he has an ocean current and several species of animals, including a penguin, named after him. Through his observations in tropical rainforests, Humboldt began to develop ideas about the interconnectedness of natural systems. He observed erosion being caused by deforestation, other problems with the water cycle due to the loss of the rainforest, and how overfishing was ruined 
ruining oyster populations along the coasts. Some people even say he predicted climate change more than 200 years before the idea re-emerged in the scientific literature. And if that isn't enough, Humboldt also inspired other legendary environmentalists like Darwin, Muir, Thoreau, and Whitman. Many people argue that the modern era of environmentalism and conservation started in the 1950s. After the World Wars, we began to recognize how we were using and abusing our natural resources. The International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, was also founded during this period, and the IUCN's red list is how we keep track of threatened and endangered species around the world. But if we really want to explore the idea of first environmentalists, we should really stick with individuals and distinct groups of people. After all, People are stakeholders in the environment, and people are the ones who will become active and organize when things go wrong. So a really fascinating example of modern environmental justice and activism I'd like to highlight is the Chipko movement from India, which started in the 1970s. The movement began as a fight between local communities and large companies trying to unjustly extract resources, primarily trees, for lumber. The nonviolent protests of the Chipko movement underlined the importance of involving all stakeholders in decisions about natural resource management, and were an important step in the trend of ecofeminism. Women proved to be integral to the success of the movement. Amrita Devi and 362 other people from her village of Kajarli died trying to save the trees surrounding their village. At other times, women were able to stay and protect trees when the men from their villages were called away by the government. Why is ecofeminism a thing? First, because women are often strongly affected by the loss of natural resources, especially when it comes to the availability of food and water for their families. And secondly, women are sometimes able to act outside of their conventional cultural roles when environmental resources are on the line. The Chipko, or literal tree hugger, movement is still active in India today. However, their efforts have expanded to focus on protecting their ecosystems as a whole, rather than only being concerned with trees. I hope the story of the Chipko movement movement, and all of the other historic environmentalists I've mentioned here, have inspired you to be more observant and care a little bit more about the natural world. Spring is a great time for new beginnings, and it's never too late to become an environmentalist yourself. As I said before, this video is part of a large collaborative playlist with other members of We Create EDU, a group of educational YouTube creators. You can find a link in the video description to the playlist with the rest of the videos on firsts, and I really recommend you go check them out as well. If you liked this video, don't don't forget to like it! If you didn't like this video, please share it with someone who would. And if you'd like to support The Roving Naturalist, remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. You can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time!